everyone, my name is Brigitte Hudak and welcome to Mindful Minute, Operative IQ's new video series where we spend a few minutes talking about some of the hottest topics and trends in operations management. In this episode, we will be chatting with Scott Grove, EMS Chief for Shelbyville Fire Department in Shelbyville, Indiana. Scott has been a trailblazer in Indiana for his impressive record with controlled substance management. In this interview, we will be asking him a few questions about how he achieved this record and how he developed such strong, trusting relationships with his pharmacist and medical director. With that, let's welcome today's guest. Thank you so much for joining us today, Scott. Thanks for having me. So Chief Grove, can you tell us a little bit about your organization? What does a typical day with Shelbyville Fire look like? Um, Shelbyville Fire Department provides ALS, uh, non-transport, and transport for all of Shelby County. Uh, we do about 5,400 calls per year. Uh, we staff two and a half trucks per day, and all of our AL or all of our uh, fire apparatus are ALS as well. Um, we are, that's about a 15 and a half run a day average or so. Um, we're the only ALS provider in Shelby County. So we cover about 420 square miles. Can you describe for us what your controlled substance SOPs look like? How do you manage them within your agency? So one of the things when I took over my job, I'm still fairly new. I came off an engine um, as an engine lieutenant to take over my position as deputy chief of EMS was our um, narcotics policy was the same as it has been for 25 years I've been here. Um, and when it became my responsibility, I wanted to look at a new and better way to be able to track and control narcotics. We are, are a, a pharmacy exchange program is basically where we started. So um, we would have a certain amount of narcotics on the engines and a certain amount of narcotics on the ambulances and usually it could be up, upwards of 15 to 20 fentanyl per truck. At the time, we carried morphine, we carried Valium, we carried Ativan, we carried all these narcotics. We also do RSI. Uh, in particular, those aren't controlled, but um, we just kind of had all of these medications and we used a simple book, log book on the apparatus. It looks like that. You would sign in on the date and time and sign out the next day with the crew, you both would sign and then uh, give your count and then write anything that happened that day. So if you gave one, you would write the patient's name. And then you would also, if you added or, or uh, if you had expired, you would write it here on this line. Then you also carry control sheets uh, in the book. And it looked like this. In the control sheet, each line is one vial and you would write, this is for the pharmacist. Um, the problem that I saw right off the gate was, how am I supposed to track this? How am I supposed to uh, make any sense if there's an issue? Uh, so I talked to my pharmacist, and like I said, we were a one-to-one -one exchange with the pharmacist that each of the medic trucks went or, or the engine went and exchanged or, or got more fentanyl as they turned into control sheet. Um, so when I went and talked to our pharmacist, um, she was real apprehensive about changing anything um, because that's the way we've always done it and she could have good control in her mind of our narcotics um, i knew right away that there was a there was a potential for problems with the current system that we had so i did my research into the dea and the dea rules that apply to ems and there wasn't a ton of guidance there for us in this time frame, we also got a new medical director, and the medical director was wanting to know our policies on narcotics, and I got him involved as well when I started looking at software to electronically track our, um, our, our narcotics. And one of the things I found right away was there's no, there's no real checks and balances here. Um, I could sign in and out for my shift in and shift out, and there's no check there. If I was going to do an audit of a safe, it would take me days to figure out where we were at already, plus try to go through everybody's logbook and then try to figure out a discrepancy. And in particular, 
um, we had a, a shorted count on one of the trucks and somebody found it and it was three weeks old. When we finally traced it back, it was three weeks old um, because there was just some, there was no checks and balances to make sure that the guys were uh, actually checking the narcotics. They were just kind of um, going through it and just kind of pencil whipping it. So we, um, we invested in uh, Operative IQ and the narcotics module, particularly for uh, the dual verification process so that each individual vial is got its own control number assigned to it by us and when they administer they do their morning checks or if um, we have a, a BL, if we happen to have a bls crew that day on the engine um, we can have two people check that at all times and that way and it's documented that way they can't they can't uh, go around that. So every day I know that it's checked and that it's been verified by two people. Once we started that process, um, I wanted to take down the amount that each truck carried and have a station vault. The Initially, the, the pharmacist was not okay with this. She was like, I don't really want to put a, a safe in your building. Uh, but once we started using Operative IQ and I gave her full access, to the operative IQ as well. And she can run her own reports. She can run her own usage reports. Um, she started to get a lot more comfortable with uh, the fact that we're taking good control of our narcotics. We have a, a good idea of what's happening. Uh, and we have the ability to audit and catch any mistakes or uh, if we ever do have a diversion that we're able to catch that pretty quickly. So as that progressed over a few years, she became really comfortable with that. And now we have our own station vault. We have um, our own ability to uh, restock our, our medics from the, the station itself. So they don't have to try to go. We've taken the amount of narcotics down on per truck. So the access that the, each individual crew has is less overall. Um, we also got rid of the paper signing. So the crews don't sign. Uh, the usage sheets anymore. I actually have them in my office and I fill those out. We quality assure all the calls that the with any narcotic usage, each run sheet gets looked at and verified and we have a, a verification sheet that we put on Operative IQ. And that, and if there's any kind of discrepancy, if there's a misspelled name, a misspelled run number, a date that's wrong, we can attach a form to that narcotic. So two or three years down the road, if a question ever comes up and say, well, it says on this form that it was administered on the 13th, but in actuality, it was administered on the 10th. It's already got the explanation on there that this was a mis misdocumentation and we don't have to hunt for it. What role does your pharmacist and medical director play in creating and enforcing your controlled substance SOPs? You know, I'm, I'm not an expert or, or the, the, the expert on EMS narcotics. So it's important to me that that the pharmacist feels comfortable but also the medical director feels comfortable with our narcotics and how we handle them and uh one of the other things that we do is uh if there's ever a um a, an issue whether it's a broken vial a caps off or the, maybe the guys are uh, uh suspect that there might be a tampering issue or there's a missing control number they have a form on their uh, on their operative IQ that it's called a um, it's called an incident report, and it's not a detailed report. It can simply be missing bile. It could be cat fell off, and as soon as they do that, it generates an email to myself, my fire chief, the medical director, and the pharmacist. I did that for a reason, so that everybody knows at the exact same time when there's an issue. I'm the one that comes into the station figures out what the problem is. And every time it's something very benign, it was a busy night, they forgot to do their paperwork. It's it's not the end of the, end of the world. I just call the medic. I can look on my uh, electronic records, see that they administered and there's not a correlating administration form done. Oh yeah, I forgot to do that. I send out a group email to the, that core group and say, hey, this was a misdocumentation. It's being handled right now. And the medic comes back and, and takes care of it. I think that gives them confidence that if there's ever an issue, they'll be aware of it right away, just the same as I am. Plus, we'll be start the investigation right away and it'll be taken care of immediately. What is one piece of advice that you've learned along the way that you wish you could share with your fellow first responders? I wish there was a book. 
Um, a lot of times that I, I tell people uh, the hardest thing is there's no manual for this. Um, there's no manual. I mean, there's there's rules that we follow. There's but usually it's it's down to individual departments. I've worked for several services um, in my career and they all do things a little bit differently. They all, uh, you know, the broad strokes are the same, but some are a little bit more um, tight here or there, do things differently. And I wish there was a, a book that just said, you need to do this, 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 and this. Um, so it's kind of, that's been kind of hard. And now I'm on year five, it's a little bit easier. I understand um, what my roles and responsibilities are. Um, so it's a little bit, little bit easier, make a lot of friends who are managers somewhere else too get their advice it's they've usually fought the same fight so thank you chief grove for all the information that you have shared and thank you for watching if you have any questions for our speaker please feel free to reach out to us at operative iq and we'd be happy to connect you with chief grove also for more mindful minute episodes head over to our website operativeiq.com forward slash webinars or check us out on youtube